Hey, how's it going? It's coming along. It's going okay. You know, I think you ought to spend some time with him. Play some catch with him. Show him you love him. I do love him. I bought him a brand new bike, and he's got his computer to play with. I really think he just wants to spend some time with you. I just bought him a brand new mitt, too. He knows that I love him. Welcome again to another session of Growing Kids God's Way. In this particular session, we're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to be talking about how to communicate love one to another, to our mates, to our children, in such a way that they actually have the full sensation of love. This is an exciting uh, lesson for all of us, Amory. It is. You're going to have a lot of fun, and hopefully you're going to learn a lot about not only yourself, but your mate, and again, your children. And the theme for tonight is every day we choose to love and every day we choose not to love. You know, in that scenario that we just saw, it's probably very common, a little boy playing catch by himself, dad busy in his office, mom concerned about that relationship. There's probably more to that scenario than just what we saw. We're going to talk about it when we come back with our class. <music> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to our third session of Growing Kids God's Way. In this session, we're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to talk about how to communicate love. If you remember, in our last session, we talked about the importance of the husband-wife relationship and how significant that relationship is in the process of bringing security to your child. Now, we're talking about the husband-wife relationship, not simply the parent-child relationship. The major theme of last, our last session was communicating to your child or creating an environment for your child that would cause them to be secure in your love for each other. That is so primary for a child. In this session, we're going to turn the corner and we're going to talk about the practical side of love. We're going to talk about what love looks like. We're going to be looking at some of the fundamental truths about man's capacity for love. In fact, on your outline, let's get started with that. Uh, learning to do the words of love. Let's start right there with letter A. Understand this. God put within man the capacity to feel love, and equally important is the capacity to communicate love. Man has both abilities. He has both capacities. One is to feel love and to know that he is love or she is love. But also, we all have the capacity to communicate love to, to others, those around us, those within our family and outside of our family. Now, these capacities really make sense. After all, man was created in the image and likeness of God. Certainly, God, as the universal, universal creator, is a God of love. We know that. In fact, we know that God is love because the Bible teaches us that. In 1 John 4, 7, and 8, we read this. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now listen, love is so important to God that he made it a distinctive identifying mark of his people, of the church. Jesus said in John 13, 34, and 35, this new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, so shall you love one another. And then he explains that commandment when he says, by this, by what? By the love of this new commandment. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. In other words, Jesus introduced for the first time in humanity 
a new badge of identification, and that badge is the badge of love. He said, this is what's going to separate you out. This is what's going to identify you as my people. Love is supremely important to God. So what we have here in just these few verses from 1 John 4, 7 and 8 and, and from John 13, uh, 34 and 35, we have two primary truths. Number one, love is a command. And number two, it serves a kingdom purpose. Do not forget that. In fact, as I will remind you from our very first lesson, that parenting in the mind of God is a kingdom issue, that our parenting has to go far beyond just our own pleasure, just our, for our own comfort, that there's a bigger picture that we are participating in. We are kingdom builders when we put the values of, that reflect God's holiness into the hearts of our children. But the question for tonight is, what does love look like? We know, see on your outline, that love has two sides. Uh, we, we love in action. Every one of us will love in action. That is, there are certain things that we do. We do for our wives, or, or as wives you do for your husbands. We do for our children. It's love in action. Uh, this is the giving side of love. But we also know that we love in feeling. That is, this is the, the receiving side of love. When someone communicates love to us, we feel their love. We appreciate that love. We have a sense about that love. So love is both action and it's feeling. Now, if that was all there was, there shouldn't be too many problems in marriages, but obviously there is. Because the problem that many marriages, and, and really in parenting, many parents with their children, especially their middle years and teen age children, problems that they have is because mothers and fathers and husbands and wives and children all have different touch points of love. Different touch points of love. Or another way to say it is we all connect with love differently. And because of that, sometimes love becomes extremely frustrating. And sometimes it's extremely discouraging. I think you moms know this. You know you work all day long and you communicate to your children love in so many different ways. And, you, at the, and then your husband comes home and you communicate love to your husband. And then you wonder, you sit back at the end of the day wondering, does anyone appreciate me? Does anyone appreciate all that I do in this place? Because you may not hear it or, or maybe there's not a gesture coming back to you. And uh, although you try to love, 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 there are moments when it's, it's frustrating. Same thing with husbands. You know, we, we know we're supposed to bring the flowers home on that day in February, and we know we're supposed to do the birthday cards and try to get the right date, and, and same thing with the anniversary. And we go through all of this, and maybe that special dinner, and sometimes we set it up, and it's not the right time, and we feel, in a sense, rejected. We feel frustrated in love, and that happens. Now, in this session, I want to teach you how to say I love you to your mates and to your children so that you are actually targeting your love in such a way that they actually feel love. They have the full sensation of love. What we're going to do is we're going to help you discover each other's touch point of love. Let me introduce this concept by way of analogy. Let me share a, a story with you about a trip that I had taken to the former Soviet Union a number of years ago. Uh, I was doing uh, some teaching there, met with some pastors. We had one day off, and I, I always wanted to see Red Square, and, and I found myself on this one day standing at the entrance of Red Square, and it was, it was something to, to see, uh, realizing all of the hundreds and hundreds of years of, of history that took place right there. And as I was really sort of, sort of taking it all in, I noticed that there was a small crowd of people gathering in the middle of Red Square. And out of curiosity, I began to walk over towards them to find out what they were gathering for. And when I got there, I realized that I was standing in front of Lenin's tomb. And what the people had, the reason the people had gathered was because they were about to exchange guards. And it was quite a ceremony to see this. You will see the same thing in, in many of the European countries in England, and certainly in this case in, the, in, in Moscow, where you have the changing of the guards, and it's quite a military uh, uh, celebration as the guards switch and everyone takes notice. Well, as the guards began to do their, their goose step march down towards the guards that were standing in front of Lenin's tomb, as the crowd was all pressing in, as everyone, you could just feel the anticipation. I heard over to my left. Now, you've got to understand, most of the people there were speaking Russian. I don't speak Russian. So it was sort of like a humming in my ears. It didn't mean anything to me. But as the guards were coming down, I heard over to my left these words. Hey, Larry, 
Come on over here. You can get a great shot. And immediately I turned. English. Someone spoke English in Red Square on that day. Now, I turned. No one else turned. No one was even phased by it. Why was I so caught up with those words? The reason was because English is my primary native language. It's the language I know. It's the language I speak. It's the language I feel most comfortable with. We've been living in Southern California, Henry and I, long enough that Spanish is really our second strongest, or more appropriately said, second weakest language. If Spanish was being spoken that day in Red Square, I would have picked it up. Not as quickly as English, but certainly a lot faster than if it was just Russian. French is my third weakest language. If, if French was being spoken that day in Red Square, I would have picked it up, but not as quickly as Spanish. Spanish I'm more familiar with, and certainly not as quickly as, as English because English is my native tongue. That, that, that's the tongue I speak, that's the one I hear, that's the one I tune into. When the crowd was gathering, everyone was up on their tippy toes, and you know, you got a little shoving in the crowd that goes on, not intentionally, but I, I began to trip a little, and as I did, my, my heel kicked the person behind me. And so I, I immediately turned around and said, excuse me to this person. Now this person has no clue what I was saying. Uh, I could have been saying, hey, buddy, your mother drives a tank. Uh, I could have said anything. Now, English is what I said. I spoke English. I, I didn't get out my Russian English translation book. I, I, I just spoke English because it just naturally flowed out of me. Now, the lessons of that day serves as a guide to the principles that I want to share with you right now. Uh, the same thing that happened in Red Square in Moscow that day is true with emotional languages. It's that sometimes you may be emotionally speaking your native tongue, but it comes across as a foreign language to the person you're talking to. And the reason that sort of thing happens emotionally is because we tend to only speak love languages that we are most familiar with or we are most accustomed to. And we tend to assume, naturally, that everyone else understands our emotional language. Just like in that day when I turned around and said, excuse me, to the man behind me. I didn't even give a second thought that that person doesn't speak English. All through the day, we do the same thing emotionally. We say, I love you, in our primary touchstone, our primary love language, to our children, to our husbands, to our wives, when in fact their emotional love language may not be the same. And therein lies so many of our problems. We tend to be insensitive to the emotional love languages of those around us, so our love message sometimes is reduced to nothing more than a humming in our ears. But we're going to fix that potential problem right now as we look at the five touch points of love. Uh, consider these emotional languages. Let's write them down in your outlines. Let's get started. Love language number one, this first touch point of love, is, can be described as encouraging words. Encouraging words. The Apostle Paul identifies the power of love when he told the Corinthians that love edifies, 1 Corinthians 8.1. That means love is communicated when we rightly build up others through verbal encouragement. For example, just kind words or encouraging words. You're such a, a compassionate person. I could learn so much from you. Or that dress so compliments you. Or I love your hair. Is that new? Or my all-time favorite, which I love hearing, have you been losing weight? Those are words of encouragement. Those are words that I, I long for. But really what they are they are legitimate words of praise. It, for some people, words of encouragement, words, words of praise, that is their primary love language. That means that they feel most loved when they hear words of encouragement. That is important for all of us. Not frivolous words, not words that, that are anything less than, than serious or a true compliment. But for some, there is no greater way to express the language of love than through words of legitimate praise and recognition. A second love language is acts of service. Now the Apostle John encouraged Christians to love in action through deeds and truth, 1 John 3.18. That is another way of communicating love through acts of service. Now, now what is acts of service? Acts of service is doing something for another person over and above the, the routine. It's doing something for another person that you know they're really going to appreciate. For example, for a, a dad, maybe it's putting gas in your wife's car 
on Sunday night so that when she takes the kids to school all week long, she doesn't have to worry about it. Or maybe it's finally going around fixing the leaky faucet or whatever it may be. But it's doing something for the other person over and above. But something you know they're really going to appreciate. I love having a clean patio. I, 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 we have a little patio and it's underneath a tree and this tree is always dropping things on it and I sweep that patio and sometimes on the weekend if I can't get to it or on Monday I can't get to that patio, I know on Tuesday I'm going to have to sweep the patio or I'm not going to sleep at night. Well, Tuesdays uh, when a, there's been a busy Monday, I'll come home thinking I need to sweep the patio. But I'll get home and the patio would have been swept. Amory swept the patio. Now Amory likes a clean patio too. But Amory was choosing to love me in an act of service because she knows how much it means to me. And that heightens the love sensation. Knowing that someone did something for you, something that, that you were going to do, but you so appreciate it that they did it for you. A third love language is gift giving. The greatest gift of love the world has ever known is Christ who gave himself for the church. Ephesians 5.25 tells us that. Gift giving is another way of saying I love you. Although a simple gesture, it packs great meaning because of what it represents. Impromptu gift giving, as opposed to the Christmas and the birthday gift giving, which you have to because if you want to live to see the next morning, you have to do that. Impromptu gift giving communicates this one central truth. When we were apart, you were so on my mind, I was driven to pick up a token of our love relationship. That's what it means. I mean, even if you were buying a gag gift for someone, the very fact that you saw something really cute and say, oh, he, Gary would love this. The very fact that you thought of the person sends a powerful love message, gift giving. It's part of the love marriage bond of every society, primitive or complex. It, it's a way of saying, I love you through gifts. A fourth love language is quality time. The gospel record provides insights to the quality time Jesus had with his heavenly father and the men that he discipled. Although his goal was to train them for ministry service, he recognized time was needed, quality time. Now, quality time with the master brought conformity to their thinking. Quality time is important. Quality time is a way of saying, I love you. Quality time is a way of saying, I want to spend time with you. Now, gentlemen, for your wife's sake, let me explain what quality time is not. Quality time is not saying to your wife on Monday night, hey, honey, want to sit next to me? We'll watch the football game together. That's a nice thing to do, but that's not necessarily quality time. It's not picking up the newspaper and reading the sports section to her. That's nice, but that's not quality time. Quality time must be confined to an understanding where there is a transfer of heart feelings, not just facts of the day, not just what you did, but actually being together and honestly probing one another's heart, responding, doing both speaking and listening. That's quality time. The third, or excuse me, the fifth love language is physical touch and closeness. Physical touch and closeness. I've often wondered what it would have been like to have been that child in Mark chapter 10, verses 13 through 16, who Jesus, King of the universe, picked up, put on his lap, and then used as an example. God made us physical creatures. We are, we are creatures that love to touch, love to be close, but for some, this is a primary love language. It could be holding hands, it could be putting your arm around your spouse's shoulder, or just standing next to your spouse, next to your, your child, or your child next to you. But that sends a special love signal to them, a love message, just being near to each other. Physical touch and closeness is supremely important. Again, it, it can be as basic as holding hands, it can go all the way to the act of marital intimacy, or anywhere in between. It's just physically being with each other. Now, ladies and gentlemen, those five love languages I have just given you, um, words of encouragement, acts of service, gift giving, quality time, and physical touch and closeness. Out of that list of five we just discussed, one of those means more to you than the other four. And there's going to be one on that list that's going to mean the least to you. You say, well, I don't really need this one. But there is one on that list that becomes, or in fact is, your touch point of love. And we're going to need to discover that. Let me give you some scenarios, first of all, to, to really develop this a little bit further, some examples. Let's take the example of physical touch. That'll be the husbands. That'll be Matt and Sue. We'll use them. Physical touch versus words of encouragement. Matt was physical touch. 
Sue's words of encouragement. This is a true story. After a conference, uh, there, a couple came to us about two weeks later, and they shared how this particular teaching was such a tremendous help in their marriage. They had a good Christian marriage. Uh, I mean, it, it wasn't a flame with love. There was still, the pilot was still on, at least. But this changed everything because it brought fulfillment to them. It t happened that the husband's primary love language, that which meant the most to him, was physical touch and closeness. But his number five, the, the least on his list, words of encouragement. Guess what her number one was? Words of encouragement. And her number five, physical touch and closeness. They were exactly the opposite. So he would be saying, love physically, honey, uh, how, about a, how about a hug? She would be saying, uh, send me a letter. Because she wanted words of encouragement. Physical touch and closeness, you could, you could cuddle your cat if you want physical touch and closeness. Write me something beautiful. Words that flow from your heart. So for that wife, words of encouragement, that was number one. They loved each other, but they kept missing each other. He was saying, I love you physically. She was saying, I love you in words of encouragement. When they learn this lesson, when they learn that really what love is, love, in fact, is something that we do every day. We choose to love every day, and we choose not to love every day. When they learn to choose to love each other in the other's primary love language, everything turned around. He started to leave notes around the house, something very simple, something, honey, love you, see you when you get home. That little note meant so much to her because her primary is words of encouragement. But it's more than just words. It's the fact that you would take the time to say the words. That's what brings greater meaning. When he was going out the door, he, she would say, Honey, don't go out the door. I need to give you your hug first before you go to the office. That sent a very positive signal. That, that sent a signal that she really does love me. She connected with his touch point, his primary touch point. He was connecting with her primary touch point. They took the pilot, and again, the flame was restored back to the marriage. There are other illustrations like this. Uh, there are times when you have a, a, a husband with acts of service. That's his predominant. And you have a, a wife who, in fact, is quality time. The scenario looks like this when they come through the door. They, they hug. They embrace. The wife says, she's got so much to tell her husband. She says, honey, uh, uh, the mail, and I got the phone calls. And How about if I make some coffee before you get into tonight's activities? We just sit down on the couch a little bit, and, and we can share, and I can share what happened today. You could tell me about your big meeting at the office. So the husband agrees and says, oh, okay, that'll be, that'll be fine. Why don't you go in and make the coffee and get some of that cheese and crackers, put them out. I'll just change my clothes, and I'll be right back out. So the wife goes in as a dutiful wife. She gets everything done. Uh, the, the, the coffee's made. She brings it out, but the husband's still not there. And so she gently calls into the, into, the, uh, into the bedroom, Honey, darling, are you coming? And from the bedroom she hears, Be right there, sweetie. There were some clothes in the bed, and I'm putting them away, so we don't have to worry about that later. And so she thinks, What a wonderful man. And then a few moments goes by. The coffee's getting colder. She's getting a little bit warm. And she says, darling, you said you would sit with me. I got everything out here. Be right there, honey. I was just coming out. I was hanging up my tie, but the light bulb tur uh, burnt out. I'm going to fix it and, and change it so you don't stub your toe tonight. And she's thinking, well, he's, he's caring. And then a few moments later, he, he's dashing through the kitchen, and he's going to put the, throw the light bulb away. And she says, now, honey, you're going to come with, sit down with me now? And he says, be right there, sweetie. The garbage is, is full. I'm going to just take it out so we don't have to worry about it. And now she's lost him to the garage. <laughs> so eventually she finds her way to the garage. She says, you said you, are, you were going to sit with me. And from a, a, a echo chamber, because he's got his head in the dryer, honey, the dryer stopped and Miles will bring the clothes in. No use doing two trips. I'll be right there. Eventually this guy finds his way to the couch and the wife's there and she's, well, the coffee's cold and she's hot. And, and he says, what do you want to talk about, darling? And she says, well, I, I, I don't want to talk. Well, why did you go through all of this? You told me you wanted to talk. Well, I did want to talk, but I don't think that you love me. He says, love you? Love you? What are you saying? I come home. You know how many women would give anything to have a husband like me? I, I put away the laundry. I change the light bulb. I take the garbage out. I bring the laundry in. If you don't have anything to talk about, I still got to do the kitchen floor tonight. <laughs> the problem? They really did love each other. But they never connected at each other's primary touch point. She said, I love you means... Spend 10 minutes with me on the couch. He said, I love you means acts of service. He did love her, but he loved her in his primary. 
not her primary. See, folks, the, the summary of all of this is what you have to learn is what is your primary, more importantly? What is your mate's primary? What are your children's primary love languages? And then you need to choose to speak those languages to them. Right now, we're going to stop. Uh, what I want you to do is I want you to take your test. It's at the end of your chapter. It's the love language test. It's to help you understand exactly what your primary love language is and actually your whole ranking. We want both of you to take that test. Take a few minutes after you're done. We want you to discuss it. Right after that, Anne is going to join me for our wrap-up time, and she's going to give us some of her insights as to the practical side of how to say I love you. So take that test right now, and we'll be right back. Well, Anne-Marie, this was a fun lesson to teach. I, I'm always excited to communicate how to say I love you simply because I know after they take their exam, uh, so many new ideas pop into their minds about how they have been communicating love and how tomorrow morning they need to communicate love. Give me some of your thoughts. Yes, and, and one thing, it's going to give you wonderful topic for your couch time. You know, if you're beginning to run out of what, what do we do during couch time, you can talk about your love right. languages. A couple of things, though, as, as you were teaching, um, just want to make clear when he talked about the words of encouragement and you know they build up if that happens to be your primary love language and it's not my primary but it's very close to my primary that discouraging words really cut a lot deeper I know growing up I mean we I didn't understand about love languages then and it would frustrate me so much you know family members or whatever they might make jokes and I would take it personal and a all my life, I heard, you're just too sensitive. Well, once I understood this whole thing about love languages, I thought, well, this makes more sense because it's so high on my list that when jokes were made at my expense, it, it really hurt. So it wasn't that I was so super sensitive. It's just that understanding that whole aspect. So if, you know, if love language and words of encouragement is high, we have to be sensitive for well, that, not only in our as a spouse but with our children well, as well. Well I was just going to say especially the spouse. The spouse has to understand if, if words encourage then, then discouraging words cut deep mm -hmm. and so you, you have to remember that if that's one of your one of your high love languages. Uh, what about our own family? Well <clears throat> for us we actually are very fortunate that we uh, share the same primary love language of uh, physical touch and closeness since we do spend a lot of time together. Um, but our girls they're both different. Um, Amy's is quality time, Jenny's is gift giving, and it's really important to understand what your children's love languages are, their primary love language, because of how they're going to interact with you and mm -hmm. each other as well. Well, you could misdiagnose behavior. I know, it, just for uh, an example, if I stopped at the store and picked up a pack of Tic Tacs, let's say for Jenny. Now, Jenny's primary love language is gift giving. Mm -hmm. If I picked up a pack of Tic Tacs for, for Jenny, and I you know, just brought them home and said, Jenny, uh, here's some Tic Tacs I was in the store and I, I bought these for you. Jenny's response would be, uh, Dad, this is wonderful. Thank you so much. You're such a sweet man. She would hug me and she would kiss me. Think, that is so sweet of you. Now, Amy's primary love language is quality time, but number five for her is gift giving. Christmas is fun at her house. Now, <laughs> if I bought a pack of Tic Tacs, uh, just a little thing of Tic Tacs, and brought them home and, and gave them to Amy, say, Amy, I was in the store and I, I, well, I thought of you and I hear some Tic Tacs. Amy's response would be completely different than Jenny's. Amy would be more likely, oh, oh Dad, <laughs> if it's my breath, just tell me. Just, don't, don't be indirect, just tell me directly. And see, her response would be completely different because she's a different child. Her, her love language, primary, second, third, fourth, and fifth, her arrangement is completely different. And I think, honey, this brings us really to the core of what we want to talk to you about. Not only do you have to learn each other's primary love language, just to have that love renewed in your own relationship. It is primary, it is so important that you understand the love languages of your children because truly, in, in, in one way, in one sense, their love needs make them go, go completely unmet. In fact, what I'd like to do right now is let's, let's just pause right here and let's everyone take a look at our scenario that we showed at the top of the session. Let's uh, think through what is happening now, now that we've taught you about love languages. Let's go to that scenario right now. Hey, 
how's it going? It's coming along. It's going okay. You know, I think you ought to spend some time with him. Play some catch with him. Show him you love him. I do love him. I bought him a brand new bike, and he's got his computer to play with. I really think he just wants to spend some time with you. I just bought him a brand new mitt, too. He knows that I love him. Well, that was really a pretty sobering scene again. I need some thoughts about that. Yeah, it's probably something that occurs all too often in homes all around the world, actually. Um, and, you know, as you saw, the young boy, he wanted Dad to spend some quality time with him. And Dad thought, well, I got him a bike. Mm -hmm. You know, that's his gift giving. So he was, he was speaking his love language to his son, his son wanting something different, so neither one of them are communicating. And so it is important that we understand exactly what our children's love languages are and our, and our mates so that we can speak in a way that they feel loved. Do you think it's possible that uh, in the parent-child relationship that children can grow up in homes where moms and dads can completely miss uh, communicating to a child in his or her primary love language. And so you end up with maybe some disastrous results in the teen years when, in fact, it, it wasn't so much a, a dynamic of relationship or being unfair or a child being exasperated, but it was the absence of love. And it, it very well can be something that simple. And I know it's, this is a, a tool to help build a healthy relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, it, just the scenarios you're saying that reminds me of several years ago we were counseling with a family that were having some struggles with their 17 year old and they we taught them and told them about love languages and they said oh we've been speaking our daughter's love language it's gift giving well we had opportunity to spend some time with the daughter as well she wanted to spend time with her parents yeah, yeah. it was quality time was what she what she really desired from them she says they keep giving me these gifts i don't want the gifts i want them that's right because the parents were in a position to buy gifts right but i remember that she she yearned just to have mom and dad's presence that's what she wanted mm -hmm. so these are some things that you have to remember some of you have gone through your list and you're saying you know uh I, I know my ranking now. I really like the, the first one, the second one. I, I don't need the third, fourth, and fifth. Well, the fact is you not only need all five, you need to learn to communicate all five because all the people around you, someone has a touch point of one of those five. You need to know how to say I love you to everyone. Uh, gentlemen, this is going to help you understand your mother-in-law better. If you want to get your mother-in-law on your side, <laughs> learn her love language. It's going to be wonderful. Right now, let's just stop right here. Let's take some questions from you folks. And uh, we could fine tune our teaching through those questions, and then we'll, we'll go to our summary and uh, close down the session. Let's, who's got a question? How does love languages tie into spiritual gifts? That, that's a rather common question, and it can be answered very simply. When we study and we look at the spiritual gifts in Scripture, we find that the spiritual gifts are all one way. By that I mean the person who has the, the spiritual gift of giving loves to give. But they don't need anything in response. They don't need someone to give back to them in order to feel loved. The person who has the, the gift of helps loves to show up on Saturday morning at 7 o'clock and, and help tackle that project that they talked about at church last week. But they don't need someone to come over and work on their roof the next week in order to feel loved. So all spiritual gifts are one way. It's empowered by the Holy Spirit working through a person to give to the body of Christ, to edify the body of Christ. What we're talking about in terms of the love languages, these are two ways. You identify it not only by what you enjoy receiving, but also by what you do. So if you enjoy hearing words of encouragement, your natural tendency, because it's a love language, you tend to speak words of encouragement to others. So uh, spiritual gifts are one way. Love languages are two ways. Okay, let's have another question. Yes, this young lady here. My husband came up with a different order for my love language than I did. How do we know who is right? Honey? Well, that's, that does happen sometimes. And, and many times people around us are more apt to be able to identify our love languages than we are ourselves because they hear us all the time or they watch us. But there is that possibility that, um, and I'm going to just use words of encouragement, you know, that could be your primary. And it's been your primary, but it was abused maybe as you were growing up. You know, you, the people that were around and close to you 
um, did, either didn't give you those really encouraging words or were very flippant with it. So you kind of thought, well, that, that tends to hurt, so you go to the next one. So what your mate or others might see is maybe it's acts of service, and they say, oh, that's your primary love language. And deep down inside, you know, you, feel, you know, no, words of encouragement really is. And so um, it's a mutual talking back and forth. And then just observe. I mean, this is a new concept. You know, actually, we would suggest that you, after you go home and you talk about it a little bit more, make some three by five cards and put down, you know, each one's love language. Put your children's love language on there as well. Take a magnet and put it up on your refrigerator. Um, probably, it took us probably a good month or so before we really were able to discern exactly where each one fit. And um, so th that would be the suggestion and, yeah. and do that. And as far as your kids go, especially if you have children, you know, that are older, um, sit down with them and kind of go through the lesson with them as well and, and ask them, you know, even for your, you know, middle years child and older and, and uh, go through the different ones and see how they respond to it. Yeah. I think as a general rule though, don't you think, honey, that other people will be able to identify yours sooner than you will? Usually. Simply because other people will give you the consensus. And so it's not a matter that your husband's always right, mm -hmm. but if your husband and all your friends say this is the way it looks, that's the way it probably is. Mm -hmm. okay. Let's take a, maybe a couple more questions. Yeah, Gary, I was wondering what age can we expect to see a child's love language show up? We will, we will say, first of all, do not go home and try to figure out your one or two-year-olds love languages because they're not going to emerge. I had a conversation with my, one of my daughters uh, just uh, a couple weeks ago. She has a four-year-old and a five-year-old and she was sharing with me that she felt that this, this child was starting to demonstrate a physical touch or physical touch and closeness love language. Uh, she wasn't positive, but it began to emerge. Certainly what we're going to say to you is by the age of seven, your children's love languages begin to show themselves on a regular basis that you can start having confidence. Before seven, all children love all five of them. So uh, just enjoy your child and let them enjoy all aspects, uh, each touch point, but uh, do not try to narrow just one because what happens is mothers and fathers, if you get the wrong one in the beginning, you're going to be speaking that wrong love language when in fact uh, at this point they love them all. Right now then, let's go to our summary points, you know, back to your outlines, and let's just review this and Amory will bring some final thoughts to it. Okay, just you can follow along in your outline. It says love languages are not biblical injunctions. Love is the biblical injunction, and that's important to, to realize. The love language is, is a vehicle demonstrating the biblical principle of love. It's one way of showing what love looks like. Two, your primary love language is evidenced in two ways. You tend to speak it more often than the others, and you feel most loved when it's spoken to you. Three, these touch points in children begin to emerge um, with some order by the age of seven. We already talked about that. Feeling love is not the basis of right behavior, no more than not feeling love is the justification for wrong behavior. And that's really a critical point. We don't, love languages isn't a tool to use to manipulate people to get what you want. Um, it's unconditional love that we are giving to one another. Five, we believe the order of a person's love language is God-given. It's kind of like a, maybe a little addendum to the temperaments. Mm -hmm. And six, uh, every day we choose to love and every day we choose not to love. And that's one of the key principles of the whole lesson. Exactly. Honey, I guess the best way to summarize this is to go back to uh, John chapter 13, verse 34, when Jesus said, this new commandment I give you, that you love one another, and the key is, even as I have loved you. So when you look at that, you have to ask yourself, how did he love us? When we were least lovable in the state of sin, he loved us. There are times when we are least lovable, when it takes a lot of energy to say to a person who's not so lovable, I love you. I know there were times when, when maybe I was rough and gruff and, and maybe with the kids and I had a bad day and I would turn to, I would turn to Amy and say, Amy, uh, why did you do this? Or why is this, this not in place? Or why wasn't this sent out? And instead of saying, Amy saying, well, Dad, you know, you've got a problem. You need to take a nap and wake up in two weeks, mm -hmm. which she would have the right to say. Uh, so often, Amy would do something very simple, a beautiful gesture. She would just come over to me, put her arms around me. Uh, she would come over to me very carefully, of course, put her arms <laughs> around me. But then she would just whisper, Daddy, you must, you must have had a terrible day. 
And when she did that, when I was least lovely, when she loved me in spite of the way I was, that was such a powerful message that she diffused all of the day's hostilities simply by saying, let me communicate love to you in your primary love language, physical touch and closeness. It was something very beautiful. There will be days, I'm sure, maybe even this week, when one of you in this audience will do something that is not so lovely and your mate's going to have opportunity to minister, to love you even as Jesus loved us when we were least lovely in that moment, at that point, saying, I love you to your mate. We want you to go home. We want you to review again the lesson. You have a reading assignment. Uh, come on back uh, next time. We are going to be talking about the Father's Mandate. That is a very special presentation. Uh, I'm excited about presenting it to you dads because I come to you young men with a great sense of urgency. All that I have learned in my years of being a dad I want to share with you those mistakes that I made. I want to make sure that you guys don't make them. So join us next time. Thanks for being with us this time. I think she'll be fun if I ever get to have her. What's that? Oh, it's just a note for my dad. Are you in trouble or something? No, he just hopes that I have a good day. Is that all? Well, that's kind of personal. I wish my dad would write me a note. Well, maybe he will. Maybe he will. And welcome to a very special session of Growing Kids God's Way. In this particular session, I'm going to be talking to you dads about the Father's Mandate. Honey, the Father's Mandate, the central theme of it, has to do with the issue of trust in a relationship. Let's talk about it. Okay, it does, and how we build that trust, well, both, and I say we because moms are involved as well. As, although Gary is going to address most of his comments to dads, that doesn't get us as moms off the hook because we too are in the process of building a trusting relationship with our children. And for those of you that are attending as, as single parents, this could be a rather difficult lesson to listen to because you're thinking, well, my children don't have a dad in the home. What's going to happen with them? And I want to encourage you to please remember that God is the father to the fatherless. And there's Absolutely. a special measure of grace um, that I believe he brings into your home to, to compensate for the lack of, of dad being there. And also, I mean, truly, the principles are things that even as moms, um, we are encouraged to do with our children. The Bible teaches that moms are helpmates. Wives are the helpmates. And so there are going to be some practical things that moms, we're going to need your help to help direct your husband to motivate them and to encourage them in some of the practical areas. 
To speak about trust, let me take you back to an episode that happened in our lives not too long ago when our, our daughter Jennifer brought home her two little girls. They were feverish, and, my, and Jennifer was just checking in with Nurse Anne Marie to see what she should do. As Caitlin, the oldest sister, came wobbling through the house, she went immediately to find Grandma in her office. But Kara, the 19 month old, came over to me. She found Grandpa in the rocking chair reading, and she just said one word to me, gentlemen. She said, up. And as she she put her little hands up. I took her, put her on my lap, and I just began to cuddle with that little girl. And I felt her feverish little face, and I began to stroke her. And before I knew it, this little girl had fallen asleep in my lap. And then I began to think back, how many years has it been? 25, 26 years since I held my own children in that same tender way. And I also thought about this particular lesson, this particular teaching, because I, I realized that in that moment, little Kara trusted me absolutely. Uh, there was no question, there was no doubt about where she could find love. And I also realized in that moment that that type of trust, that unquestionable trust, that trust that's void of doubt, will someday be replaced with a knowledgeable trust. A knowledgeable trust simply means that the day will come when our children, my children, your children, our grandchildren, will learn whether or not we are really trustworthy. How about it, men? Are you trustworthy? You know, we're going to talk about that very issue, the Father's Mandate. This is the longest of all of our sessions. There will be no wrap-up. It's important that you pay close attention because what ends up coming out of this lesson could change the course of your entire family. Join us in the Father's Mandate. Mm -hmm.